Good morning, everyone from all around the globe. I'm pleased to welcome you to this virtual heat code red. Resilience has been a passion of mine for many years. And today, there's not a newspaper or a TV program that doesn't mention resilience. We need to be resilient in so many ways. We have friends and family who are dealing with COVID issues, job loss. And for me, who has a second home in Miami, I'm well aware of the need for resilience for hurricanes and other climate matters. And I'm particularly delighted that the mayor of Miami, Mayor Suarez, will be here to give us an on the ground update. After founding the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center at the Atlantic Council, I chose to add to that the Resilience Center to help people understand what resilience is, to explore your resilience personally and for the world around you. I love that the Resilience Center is action oriented. We deliver solutions. And I'm thrilled that taking on building resilience in extreme heat and against regime, re extreme heat is what we're focused on today. So I'm delighted with all the partners joining us today. And I turn it over to Kathy Buffman McLeod. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you for the warm welcome and thank you for your inspiration to found the Resilience Center and for what you do for us every day. My name is Kathy Boffman McLeod. I'm the director of the Adrian Arsht Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center. Today we're here to talk about extreme heat, the impacts, the solutions. It's often known as the silent killer. And this threat particularly preys on the growing number of vulnerable people around the world. By the turn of next century, Without preventative measures, protections, projections suggest that heat waves may affect 75% of people on the planet. And we know that it does not affect those people equally. We know that very well. And in the same time frame, in India's Ganges Valley, where South African Asian, I'm sorry, South Asian climate migration is taking place heat waves and humidity will become so extreme there that people without air conditioning will simply die. And in the last two weeks in Washington, DC and in the state of Maryland, COVID-19 testing has had to be stopped because of the temperatures and the health risks to the people administering the tests when they stand on the asphalt in the parking lots. And the temperatures with humidity felt like 110 degrees Fahrenheit or 43 Celsius. And a powerful quote from a paper released yesterday by the Climate Impact Lab from one of the researchers. With enough exposure to extreme heat and humidity, the human body suffocates in its own skin because the air is too waterlogged for sweat to evaporate. Extreme heat is or will be felt by everyone everywhere at some point. We have to build awareness to this invisible threat and we have to act. Eight months ago, with the support of the Rockefeller Foundation, we convened an eclectic group, representatives from global cities, experts in public health, finance, humanitarian assistance, disaster management, climate science, risk, insurance, and public infrastructure. We met to more deeply understand extreme heat, its solutions, and how to best deliver those solutions at scale. We're joined by that group here today. I'm very proud to announce the launch of the Extreme Heat Resilience Alliance, the ERA. 30 organizations and individuals dedicated to tackling this crisis. And our first order of business in an effort to communicate the severity and the growing dangers of extreme heat is to launch an initiative to build a global standard for naming and categorizing heat waves as has been done for tropical storms since the 1950s. We're in productive and active talks with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's National Weather Service, with the global, with the, uh, excuse me, the World Meteorological Organization and the World Health Organization. And as a group, we identified the highest priorities and key gaps on the landscape of extreme heat work and found immense expertise and immense work has taken place. But those gaps pointed our way to what we need to focus on as a group. 
and starting with, this won't surprise you, education. Education, education, education. You'll hear it a hundred times today. People do not understand this risk and we need to change that. We'll work with decision makers in a targeted way and decision makers specifically linked to vulnerable populations, which are growing. We'll advance policy using the, the deep reach and expertise of the Atlanta Council and the impressive network of the Alliance members that you'll meet. We'll build risk and finance tools with the expertise amongst the group and beyond. And we'll deliver on the ground solutions, tangible, measurable solutions in communities. Before I turn it over to our next speaker, I'd like to thank the Rockefeller Foundation for their support for this work and especially for our center. Thank you. I'm pleased now to turn to Alliance member, Commissioner Ricardo Lara, the elected insurance commissioner of the state of California. Over to you, Commissioner Lara, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Kathy, and good morning. Buenos dias from Los Angeles, California. Uh, you know, the, the, these issues of extreme heat and other climate issues, so many of us on the panel, these are personal issues for us, and this is no different. Uh, the issue of extreme heat is very personal to me. Uh, growing up in East Los Angeles, California, in a low-income community, in a basin with some of the most worst air quality in the United States, these are the conditions in many cities around the world. And when heat waves hit, these communities you know, lack air conditioning or the green spaces to help mitigate against heat waves. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, we used to sleep on the porch of our home during hot evenings to try to keep ourselves cool. Uh, and this is happening here in California, in the United States. Uh, you know, as a legislator, I was proud to author the California Cooling Act, which promotes climate re uh, smart refrigerants and air conditioners, reducing HFC emissions that are tens uh, to thousands of times more potent than carbon dioxide. And now as the insurance commissioner for the state of California, we launched a climate insurance working group focusing on policies to address risks and impacts from uh, extreme heat, along with wildfires, flood, and sea level rise. I'm excited to join the Extreme Heat Resilience Alliance with leaders from around the world. Uh, and today uh, I'm calling for us to powerfully communicate the growing dangers of extreme heat events. The first step is to name and rank heat waves which is one idea that came out of our discussions in the California's Climate Insurance Working Group. As insurance commissioner, I'm gonna be working with the Alliance, our federal state agencies, with California state legislators and global institutions to make naming and ranking heat waves a reality. We are being, in my opinion here, we're, we're being visionary here. Heat waves are a risk that has never been fully recognized by, you know, uh, but one that we are currently living with. Uh, we have a president of, you know, we're, we already have precedent, I should say. Tropical storms and hurricanes have long been named and categorized. We have red flag warnings, uh, which are used to communicate to, uh, in terms of wildfire risks. Categorizing extreme heat can provide a uh, better forewarning to protect our most vulnerable. Uh, quick example, from 1980 to 2000, there were an average of six extreme heat days here in Los Angeles every year. By 2050, that number is predicted to be 22 days. In 2018, we had temperatures shoot up to 110 degrees in Los Angeles, and tens of thousands of people lost power, shutting down air conditioning and refrigerators. For, from the very first emission regulations in the 1970s, California has proudly taken our own path and one that we hope to see the rest of our country follow. We have set strong, short and long-term clean air and climate goals, and then pursued them with a cap and trade program, a renewable portfolio standard and super, uh, super pollutant reduction initiatives. And we have worked really, really hard to democratize the enviro environmental benefits of these policies, identifying our most vulnerable communities and ensuring that these communities receive the investment to protect against climate risk. This approach aligns beautifully with the Alliance's focus on mitigating heat waves. Let me build a quick scenario. Imagine we have five day, a five-day heat wave. Families are living without air conditioning. 
Many have lost their jobs due to the pandemic and are making choices between utilities, food, and the rent with medications and food that need to be kept cool and a COVID-19 pandemic that exacerbates our response systems by making cooling centers more difficult to implement uh, and for families to access, quite honestly. You know, so scientists know uh, more about health impacts of high temperature now, uh, their duration, the lack of recovery time. If temperatures do not, uh, don't drop in the evenings, we, you know, we understand that human bodies need that recovery time to be resilient to heat stresses. So in California's croplands, the Central Valley, Coachella Valley, the Imperial Valley, there is no relief for our agriculture workers and packers. So what do I envision as the start of a solution? I envision a scenario where we better identify the risk by using data that already is being collected, then measure the impacts, then mitigate the heat waves, and then we can consider insurance to guard against crop damages and community health impacts, communities are already paying the cost of heat waves. Let's be honest. Uh, we, we want a pathway to better, uh, to better mitigate and better protect the health of our communi community. Uh, resilient community means we better understand the risk, we name the problem, measure the problem, and then we can mitigate. Uh, and in the future, we can consider insurance as a tool for communities and local governments to use in their planning, providing access to funds to protect vulnerable populations and to enhance community resilience, which is gonna be key if we're gonna continue to survive these heat waves. Communities around the world may not know the details of the international agreements like the Conference of Parties or the Paris Accord, but you know what they do know? They know about heart disease, they know about dehydration, and they know about climate impacts. Naming and ranking heat waves gives us a unique opportunity to create a consciousness and a sense of urgency so that communities can prepare and governments can focus resources to protect the most impacted by extreme heat. Thank you so much for joining us today and I look forward to uh, continuing these efforts with the Alliance. California says presente and we will continue to work with you to make sure we combat extreme heat around the world. Thank you and back to you, Kathy. Thank you, Commissioner. Inspiring, inspiring. Thank you so much. I'm excited to hand the platform over to Liz Yi from the Rockefeller Foundation. Over to you, Liz. Thanks. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you, Commissioner Laura. And, and in particular, thank you to Kathy for bringing this action-oriented alliance together to put a spotlight on the silent killer of heat and really make sure that we're educating and protecting our communities. This is a really exciting and pivotal moment in this important work. And I also just wanted to thank our partner, Adrian Arsht, um, for your war warm welcome. We're really glad to be working alongside with you on this. Um, and good morning and good afternoon and good evening to, to the rest of the audience. My name is Liz Yi. I'm the chief of staff at the Rockefeller Foundation, and our foundation's mission is to pr promote the well-being of humanity throughout the world. And we're just so pleased um, to see this alliance come to life and proud to have partnered um, with the center and the, the group of participants on this phone to really help lay the groundwork for this alliance. And I'm very glad to be here with you today to support the work of the Extreme Heat Resilience Alliance. With the number of record high heat days increasing and average temperatures rising, um, heat continues to be one of the leading causes of weather-related deaths. And so while we at the foundation continue to work tirelessly on our strategy to scale testing around the world so that we can keep people safe and open our economies safely, we can't forget that extreme heat is actually working against us and complicating our ability to combat this virus because it makes it harder to wear a mask it makes it harder to socially distance. As Kathy said in her remarks, um, it, it can be even too hot to run testing, so we don't even know where the virus is and where it's going. We need to take quick action to address this growing threat, and in particular, as the pain and suffering that is wrought by COVID-19 is only exacerbated by these extreme temperatures. It's, as, as Commissioner Laura said as well, it's our vulnerable populations, the elderly, the economically and socially disadvantaged who are suffering the most from COVID and who are also most susceptible to heat. So we have to partner with our communities to understand the dangers of extreme heat, make sure they, they understand the dangers of extreme heat. And we're so pleased to partner with organizations on the phone and like the Adrian Arsh Rockefeller Resilience Center to help develop and deliver solutions to support them. Um, whether that be in New York City, our hometown, 
Guatemala City or Dakar. Um, AIR's initiative to name and categorize heat waves um, is innovative and it holds immense potential to really be the universal standard around the world that helps warn people and helps prepare people in ways large and small uh, for the reality of the life we're living in higher temperatures. And I know that it will also save many lives. So we're, we're looking forward to the concrete work ahead um, and to partnering with the Alliance and, and the Resilience Center to protect our communities from extreme heat. So thank you, Kathy, um, for your leadership and back over to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. In inspiring work uh, from the Rockefeller Foundation and what a challenge you're facing. Uh, we're behind you. Thank you. I know that everybody here um, lives in a community and we know that cities are on the front lines of every crisis of COVID-19, of hurricanes, of floods, of earthquakes and, and extreme heat as well. And so I'm very pleased to turn the microphone over to Mayor Kostas Bakoyanis from Athens. Over to you. Well, greetings from Athens, and I'm absolutely delighted to be among the many distinguished members of this Extreme Heat Resilience Alliance of the Ars Rockefeller Center. And we are right initially joining forces behind a holistic and visionary effort to mitigate the effects of extreme heat. Heat, whether it's hot summers or deadly heat waves, is not a foreign concept for the city of Athens and its nearly four million residents. Two reports that were, re that were released rather recently highlight the unique challenges that Athens faces from extreme heat events. Not only the, he the health risks posed by heat waves and increasing temperatures, but also the real and significant economic risks, particularly to Athens' credit rating and tourism. A 2018 analysis of 571 European cities by the Newcastle University ranked Athens as a European city most at risk to heat waves. A report released a few months ago by Moody's claims that the city's increased intensity and frequency of heat waves is expected to depress tourism and negatively impact our overall economic strength. With extreme heat being one of our city's greatest challenges, we prioritized resilience efforts, taking actions to reduce the risks and mitigate the impacts of heat waves on our residents' health and well-being. In this context, Extreme Global is a smartphone app that provides personalized information to city residents and visitors about their heat health, heat health risks. It uses real-time meteorological data for one specific location and directions to the nearest cooling spaces. The app was first developed in Athens and is now adopted by Paris and Rotterdam, Milan, and is actually scaling back up as we speak. At the same time, Athens is the first city to finance new green and blue infrastructure through the natural capital finance facility managed by the European Investment Bank. We are currently developing five major nature-based solution projects while also investing in increasing and better managing our existing urban green spaces. Finally, the very first project that we implemented at the onset of our term has transformed one of the city's hottest downtown areas, the emblematic Omonia Square, to a cool oasis. We created one of the largest water fountains in Europe, creating through evaporative cooling a new microclimate for several blocks in the area. In conclusion, as many of you know, Athens has historically experienced some of the worst heat waves. To name and to categorize heat waves is a monumental step to show Athenians and the rest of the world that heat waves are not going anywhere anytime soon. With more knowledge and warning of these disasters, we can better prepare and respond, and most of all, save lives. Once again, many, many thanks. Thank you very much, Mayor Bakuyanis, and over to you, Mayor Suarez. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for this opportunity um, to be here with all of the partners at the Atlantic Council, and particularly to join uh, the Extreme Heat Resilience Alliance. Uh, Miami currently has about 25 dangerous heat days per year, days that feel actually like 
104 degrees or hotter. By 2015, that could increase to over 100 days per year. Extreme heat and humidity is particularly dangerous for the youth, our elder adults, low-income individuals, and outdoor workers. We're all very aware of how impactful diseases can be. And a hotter, wetter climate will continue to increase the length of mosquito season, which can make residents more susceptible, more susceptible, susceptible to mosquito-borne viruses. The heat will be more oppressive during prolonged power outages that can follow hurricanes. Warming ocean temperatures are expected to make hurricanes more intense. One of the initial features of the Miami Forever Climate Plan is to map urban heat islands and plant trees there or take other measures to make them cooler. Reducing greenhouse gases is critical to allowing heat to be released into the Earth's atmosphere and widespread adoption of electric cars will be a great first step in carbon mitigation. The city of Miami has committed to carbon-wide, carbon, a community-wide carbon neutrality by 2015. Miami is a signatory on the pledge to uphold the goals set out by the Paris Climate Accord. First, the city has a recovery planning team and advisory committee of business and community leaders. That's what we're doing now. Climate change and environmental protection are, of course, always a top priority for the city of Miami. We rely on natural resources to protect us from the elements and the onsets of hurricane season serves as a pressing reminder for how critical this is to Miamians. The city's primary focus recently, however, has been bridging the gap for residents between economic closures and rent payments. We've had 45,000 people apply for rent and utility relief under our Stand Up Miami assistance programs, as well as 162 businesses for our forgivable loans. What we're looking at towards the future. That being said, we cannot ignore the long term. We have already seen the way COVID is permanently changing the way we operate. I think things like Zoom meetings will become ubiquitous with how we do business even after we come out of the pandemic. We need to look at how we can help businesses adapt to the new ways of operating and how to ensure individuals won't get left behind by a rapidly evolving economy. Building up Miami's climate resilience, resiliency goes hand in hand with this. Miami can't stand up if we're coping with the shocks and stresses of daily climate emergencies. Developing our resiliency infrastructure like seawalls, backflow valves, and living shorelines will provide Miamians and local business and local businesses job opportunities. These infrastructure projects are all paid for through the Miami Forever Bond. Our long-term recovery strategy aims to support Miami business through policies and programs that will, at the same time, advance our trans and transition to a clean energy economy. Our goal to become carbon neutral by 2050 still stands. The city has already reduced its citywide carbon emissions by over 25% since 2006 through efficient building requirements in our land use code, supporting PACE finance for energy efficient retrofits and solar and improvements to our transportation system. This year, we're building a robust plan to achieve this carbon neutrality goal. We expect to release the plan in early 2021. We also expect to have our stormwater master plan in place uh, by hopefully the end of this year. And we're working on a variety of other goals to make sure that we can measure a uh, heat in our community in ways that we can measure the cooling effect of the actions that we're taking, uh, which will allow us to be much more data driven than we have been in the past. Thank you and I wish you all much success. Thank you, Mayor, and over to you, Secretary Robles from Mexico City. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues. I'm very pleased to be here with you all today. Uh, while it is in our greatest interest as Mexico City to lead our city into zero carbon emission following the Paris Agreement, we are aware that there are other complex problems created by the way our cities have developed over time with severe consequences, mainly over the less favored populations. One of which is today's subject, urban heat island. In our city, along the past 50 years, the temperature has increased four Celsius degrees. Most of this increase is due to the urban heat island effect and less proportion to climate change. It is of the greatest relevance and interest to enhance meaningful actions 
that will decrease the effects and root causes associated with bad urbanization process, as well as climate change impact. Part of our job and our interest of being part of this alliance is to get to know and share best practices to fix and create a real future for our city and, of course, for the world. Within our city, we have developed several intersectoral programs and policies with a green infrastructure frame, both for the urban realm and the rural areas that surround us. For this, we have created, between others, a program called Sowing Parks that will create at least 16 big spaces in different places along the city and other strategy with a group of pocket parks, of which we intend for the city to have at least one of them for each of the 1,800 neighborhoods that build the whole city. Aside from offering public spaces for recreational and meeting purposes, we want to understand which are the minimal sizes and the maximum distances that we need from these sites to achieve the decrease in heat islands and serve as pollution filters. As of right now, our city is practically divided by huge asymmetries. The West Park, with counties that reach 21 square meters of green areas per inhabitant with good accessibility, and the East, with one or two square meters per inhabitant which is why it has led us to sow and build these parts predominantly in the east, where green infrastructure is mostly needed. Mexico City, like every big city, is full of enormous challenges, but also of great hopes. And one of them is to ensure a city of innovation, inclusiveness, and equality, a safe city full of happiness, a city to be made an example of for the white willfulness to change and transform what seems to be a doomed future into a sustainable one. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone, uh, and thank you, Cathy, for having me here today. My name is Krish Lamon. I'm the Chief Residence Officer for Chennai. We've been a part of the Adrian Ash Rockefeller Foundation Residence Center from the very beginning. And we're so pleased to be a part of the next chapter with the Extreme Heat Residence, uh, Residence Alliance. China, as you know, has just three seasons. There's hot, hotter, and hottest, with summer temperatures regularly reaching about 109 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about 42.8 uh, degrees Celsius. This heat amplifies all other risks on the effects of COVID-19, to food and water insecurity, especially amongst the 2.5 million people living in our slums and the migrant workers in our city. The EHR Alliance brings the potential to provide relief to the millions of people who are suffering by scaling urban horticulture as a nature-based solution to heat risk. Through rooftop, ground level and mobile gardening, we can combat heat and at the same time produce local food and harness and conserve water. We are thrilled to join this initiative and help scale better interventions in Chennai and beyond that will save lives. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone, and good evening from Singapore. I'm Lauren Sorkin, the Executive Director of the Global Resilient Cities Network. Thank you so much to the Adrian R. Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, you've just heard from five of the incredible members of our network, which thanks to the Rockefeller Foundation's generous and continuing support is the world's leading city-led urban resilience practitioners network. We are dedicated to building our members capacity as well as channeling investments and solutions to make cities stronger, safer, and more equitable, and to sharing this knowledge with the world. We've joined this timely alliance with our cities to protect their most vulnerable citizens. Many, many more of our cities have been identified extreme heat as a top threat to their vulnerable communities. With our partners and as part 
of Cities for a Resilient Recovery from COVID-19, our knowledge sharing platform, we've built an extreme heat community of practice, and we will bring that to bear on this high impact partnership. Again, thank you for having me, and we're looking forward to next steps. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jad Daly, the president and CEO of American Forest, uh, the nation's oldest forest conservation organization. And we're incredibly excited to join this uh, alliance and, and bring the power of trees to this critically important work um, of heat resilience. A uh, couple messages for you today, just two top line messages. Number one, we cannot win on heat resilience or slowing climate change without the power of trees. Uh, our organization did a study uh, in the city of Dallas uh, that found that reversing the city's declining tree cover and actually building it back better could reduce heat-related deaths by 22%. Uh, so trees are literally life and death infrastructure uh, in cities and becoming more so all the time in the face of climate change. But here's the deal. Uh, they do that work without requiring uh, energy, without generating greenhouse gas emissions, and actually by sequestering uh, a significant amount, almost a fifth of the carbon the dioxide captured by trees and forests in the United States is taking place uh, in urban forests. And so we have this huge opportunity to provide natural cooling. Uh, that's also a natural solution uh, to the problem of, of climate change. But I want to leave you with one second critical takeaway, and I so appreciate Commissioner Lara's uh, remarks on this uh, point and all of the other speakers that followed. Uh, this is also an equity issue. This is a climate justice issue because a map of tree canopy in virtually any city uh, in America is also a map of income. And in many cases, it's a map of race in ways that transcend income because of the structural racism and legacies of, of things like redlining. Um, so we have serious work to do, not just to put more trees into cities and take better care of the ones that we have, but to focus that work through the lens of tree equity so that we're prioritizing that work, we're prioritizing that investment uh, in the neighborhoods that are underserved in so many ways, that have greater vulnerabilities to heat in so many ways, uh, but that also are lacking that uh, protection that we can provide uh, through trees. So American Forest is just thrilled to be part of this really exciting and powerful alliance and to bring our knowledge, our expertise, tools like our new tree equity score um, to help us uh, partner with cities uh, all around the world uh, to use trees as part of the solution. Thanks so much. Hello, uh, it's, it's really an honor to be here. My name is Tam Nguyen. Uh, I'm the Global Head of Sustainability at Bechtel Corporation and head of Bechtel.org, uh, its social enterprise. So quickly, Bechtel is a global engineering construction company. So we've completed 25,000 projects, 160 countries and seven continents. So for us, extreme heat is, is actually, it's really more, it's more than a global issue. It affects the quality of the infrastructure, the services it provides and the health and well-being of the people. It's intended to help. Uh, it's more than a technical challenge for us. It's a human one. Uh, and we've heard through many of the um, uh, early speakers that the people who tend to suffer the most are the, the ones that are most vulnerable. So like the others, we're thrilled to join the Alliance uh, and at the same time humbled by the opportunity to share our technical knowledge and experiences. Having worked in some of the hottest places on earth, we understand the human toll of extreme heat and the need to help governments, businesses, and society rethink and retool their policies and practices. So Bechtel has a proud tradition of taking on some of the toughest uh, projects and challenges on earth. So we look forward to doing our part to advance this alliance and also to help build uh, resilient and sustainable cities and communities. Thank you again. Good morning. I am Isaac Anthony, CEO of Griff SPC. CRIF was formed in 2007 as the world's first multi-country risk pool based on parametric insurance and provide catastrophe risk insurance to Caribbean and Central American governments. It is designed to limit the financial impact of natural hazards such as hurricanes, earthquakes, and excess rainfall by providing quick liquidity to governments, which would of course help them reach vulnerable groups. In 2014, CRIF was restructured into a segregated portfolio company to facilitate offering new products and expansion into new geographic areas. While many may not consider extreme heat in the same category as natural ha other natural hazards, we know that extreme heat is having and will continue to have a significant impact on populations. 
we believe that we must quickly and better understand the depth and breadth of the cost of the impact and it's an area that we must explore. So we have joined the Alliance to lend and leverage our experience, and importantly, to explore how CRIF SPC can support and provide a home for the risk and finance solutions created by the Alliance and its partners. We are indeed eager to begin work with the Alliance to help and find new solutions to this growing problem. I thank you. Hi, good evening, good afternoon, um, good morning, everybody. My name is Sophie Evans. I'm the head of the country programs work at the Center for Disaster Protection based in London. Thank you for the kind invitation um, for, to speak today. Firstly, let me say a huge congratulations to Kathy, um, the whole team for bringing this to life. Many of us have been involved from the beginning, a couple of ideas over coffee and now coming together to speak today to demonstrate our collective commitment to extreme heat. And also thank you to Adrian for, for believing in us all. Um, so we at the Centre are delighted to join the Alliance as its quality assurance partner. At the Centre, we support low and middle income countries and the international system to better manage risks because we believe disasters, like the ones we're talking about today, shouldn't be surprises. As part of our work, we have a free quality assurance service that works to ensure that we not only have more risk financing solutions available for at risk and vulnerable populations, but also that we have better and quality risk financing that's genuinely delivering for the poor and the vulnerable so they can plan, prepare, and crucially pay for disasters and the impacts of disasters. So we're very excited to be working together with all of our Alliance colleagues around the world to bring this to life. Thank you very much. I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Hello everybody. My name is Vikram Weij and I'm pleased to represent two organizations today. The Climate Policy Initiative, which is an analysis and advisory organization that works with governments, businesses, and financial institutions to drive economic growth while addressing climate change. I'm also happy to represent the City's Climate Finance Leadership Alliance, CCFLA, for which CPI is the secretariat, and which is a coalition of leaders committed to deploying finance for city-level action at scale by 2030, several of whom we've already heard from. We've joined, both have joined the Extreme Heat Res Resilience Alliance to advance our complementary missions and bring finance solutions at scale for this growing climate risk, as well as to maximize the reach of our mutual networks. Uh, this is also personally important to me as I am a fellow with the Ars Rockefeller Resilience Center, and I congratulate uh, Kathy and the team on this great launch. We understand the increasingly urgent need to bring resilience finance to cities and communities who are at the front lines of this silent killer and growing crisis and believe that the launch of this alliance is timely and exciting and look forward to the tangible re results we can all achieve together. Thank you. Greetings from Los Angeles, California. Uh, my name is Jonathan Parfrey. I'm the executive director of Climate Resolve and our organization is very pleased to join the Extreme Heat Resilience Alliance, a new collaborative uh, effort uh, here in California. Climate Resolve uh, has established a number of climate collaboratives, both at the regional and statewide level. In Los Angeles, uh, Climate Resolve has helped establish new building codes and unique projects to support cooling efforts, such as cool roofs and cool streets, that actually bounce solar radiation back into space, uh, defeating the uh, climate problem at the core. And we've also been an advocate of enhancing tree canopy uh, in our region. And we are now looking to new exciting uh, insurance tools to help protect the most vulnerable. And with the Alliance, we do look forward to the next steps. Thank you. Good afternoon from Zurich. That's David Bresch. I'm chairing the Veteran Climate Risks Group at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Brief 80 Zurich. I'm very, very honored to, to support this effort um, that I've developed out of a memorable Bilancio meeting eight months ago. Um, my group works mainly on, namely on economics of climate adaptation, also termed ECA, since 2008. 
Uh, still, at that time, I was with Swiss Re, and he was already supported by the Rockefeller Foundation, deeply indebted to, to these colleagues, um, as well as applied to some of the CRIF constituent countries in 2010, and since then has developed as one of the methods to look into complex issue, issues such as the intersection between the need to adapt to changing environment while craving for, for development, so looking at climate resilience indeed. Um, my group brings climate impact modeling in a globally consistent fashion to this, to this effort here with a focus on social vulnerability, um, all open source and access uh, without um, kind of put the other needs to be like this, I think. By doing so, we support local decision making on all both spatial and time scales, especially from early warning to long term planning. Um, what I really appreciate about this effort that we do link a broad range of very relevant constituencies around extreme heat. And I think um, naming heat waves will be a pivotal. Um, people will step in a very practical sense in the step. Thanks again for having the opportunity and the, 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 the honor to join this effort. Greetings from Panama. Um, we, as at the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, is honored to be part of this important alliance. We are running already a humanitarian multi marathon in the Americas and in the world. The race to find solutions to extreme heat events is essential. Today, we join the voices and actions of great partners, organizations, and knowing that among other things, the important step towards to recognition and intent to create a global standard for naming and ranking heat waves around the world in the same way that we do for tropical storms is needed, highly needed. Inaction is not longer an option. The expansion of the superheated areas will be a major driver for future migration, exclusion, and problems if we do not add and invest. The Red Cross and Red Crescent Network, present in 192 countries, is ready to roll up our sleeves to work on solutions. Sincere thanks to Cathy and all the friends and colleagues at the Atlantic Council and Adrian Harch Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center for inspiring this useful and practical initiative. Let's work together. We need to mass run together in the era. Thank you very much. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, greetings from London. My name is Ekoswehi Iahen. I'm with the Insurance Development Forum, or, or IDF, as we often refer to it as. Uh, and the IDF is a public-private partnership led by the insurance industry, but also supported by international organizations, including the World Bank Group uh, and United Nations Development Program. We have a mandate to expand the use of insurance and related risk management tools to help support resilience building and also provide protection for those who are most vulnerable. Um, for us and from my perspective, extreme heat is a growing challenge. Um, I think, uh, as we all know, 2019 was the second hottest year on record, uh, but it's also a hazard or a risk that's not very well understood in terms of its impact, be it on the human body, but also in terms of economic productivity. So the role of the IDF in the Alliance is to really support an active endeavor to try to understand what that impact is. Um, but beyond looking at the impact, also trying to support in an active way with the members of the Alliance, how do we contribute to reducing um, the impact that we are seeing, but importantly, also develop the kinds of risk transfer and risk financing tools that are needed to help address this very critical issue. So again, I just want to say thank you to Cathy, the Resilience Center, and also the colleagues who are part of this alliance. And we are looking forward to being a part of this and supporting this endeavor and bringing to bear the capacities that exist within the IDF. So thank you very much to all of you. Good morning, good evening. Uh, my name is Kaspar Alman. I'm a climate scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. Um, as background, NCAR is a research organization that focuses on weather and in fact the whole Earth system and its climate. We work on behalf of and in collaboration with over 100 universities. Um, among other things, we develop models to study and forecast both weather and climate and to predict uh, possible future trends. And this covers scales from the global scale all the way down to local settings and in fact also cities with urban canyons and we can include urban forests, right, which is 
a nice topic that came up in at the Bellagio meeting. We use these tools to assist also in a broad range of application, not just as theoretical things. And our goal is really to collaborate within these settings as this, this alliance at a level so that weather and climate data is not just a black box that one brings in, but that it help that we can help to identify the real range of the hazards that they vary drastically in nature, depending on socioeconomic setting, location, time of year, and so on. We want to participate in really identifying what the different nature is. And I think it is rather important to understand how well we can actually predict then these features that we identify that have various types of impacts. Um, from our side as well here at NCAR, uh, many thanks to Kathy and the team for the opportunity to continue this work that has started at the Bellagio meeting and to be part of this really timely alliance. This is, it's a great honor to be here and we're looking forward to, to offer our tools and um, experience to help advance this agenda. Thank you. My name is Omar Abu Samra. I'm the director of the Global Disaster Preparedness Center, which is hosted by the American Red Cross in partnership with the IFRC. The GDPC is committed to supporting the Red Cross and Red Crescent Network to safeguard communities from the impacts of climate change, natural and human caused disasters. The rapidly increased, increasing threat of, human, of extreme heat compels us to look beyond our strong network to pair with other organizations to advance our shared goals and objectives. The new Extreme Heat Resilience Alliance is one such group whose components together will advance efforts to raise awareness of this threat and the impacts of the threat and impacts of heat, help us improve safety actions, expand research and save lives. Hi everyone, my name is Julia Riggi and I work with the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center. The Climate Center's mission is to reduce the impacts of climate change and extreme weather events on vulnerable people. And we do this in partnerships focused on policy practice and research. We're happy to join this alliance to reduce heat risks globally. Climate change and urbanization are two transformative trends of our time. And one of the ways they acutely collide is in urban heat risks. As we've heard, heat risks are poorly understood and efforts to reduce heat impacts are woefully underfunded. Therefore, we look forward to collaborating with partners in this alliance to increase our knowledge base, scale the simple low cost actions to reduce risks when heat waves strike and to support the longer term solutions to reduce extreme heat in the first place. So congrats to the team for this launch and looking forward to the months and years ahead. Hello everyone, I'm John Stone from the Risk Informed Early Action Partnership, or REAP, which brings together sovereign governments, humanitarian development and climate actors with the aim of making 1 billion people safer from climate extremes and disasters by 2025. We're delighted to join the Alliance and work on this global challenge. We all know that extreme heat is going to lead to more and more preventable deaths due to the impacts of climate change. But of course, this shouldn't be the case. We have the science, we know what support the most vulnerable need, but do we have the tools and agreement to take action? This is why the Alliance is so important to provide these critical components. REAP will support the Alliance through global policy agreement ahead of COP26, which is hosted next year in Glasgow. We're going to encourage action from our partners on this critical issue, and it's great to see many of our partners already involved in the Alliance, and we will work towards empowering the most vulnerable to get the assistance that they need. So brilliant to be part of it and, and great work on the launch so far. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm Jackie Higgins calling from Washington, DC. I'm the new head of public sector solutions for Swiss Re. Um, Swiss Re, Swiss Re, the Swiss Re group is one of the world's leading providers of reinsurance of reinsurance and insurance, and we work to make the world more resilient and are committed to global sustainability and providing insurance solutions to combat climate change. Um, our, our dedicated public sector team works with public sector clients to develop innovative risk transfer solutions to help fill the production gap. And recently we've been working with some of our fellow Alliance members to develop innovative extreme heat solutions. As such, we're very pleased to join the Extreme Global Heat Alliance um, and are looking forward to offering our tools and experience and working together to advance this very critical agenda. Thanks again and looking forward to working with all of you. 
Sorry, Bernstein. I'm the interim director of the Center for Climate, Health, and the Global Environment at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Boston Children's Hospital. And I'm speaking today from Boston. I'm also a newly minted fellow of the Adrian R. Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center at the Atlantic Council. And it is an absolute honor uh, to be part of uh, this new initiative, the Extreme Heat Resilience uh, Alliance. And uh, for me, it, the, the reason that, that this extraordinary uh, collaboration among many organizations, experts, uh, cities from around the world uh, is so important is that our science tells us that in the not too distant future, as many as 3 billion people may be living in parts of the world where it's simply too hot to live. And that, that risk is a risk that none of us can accept. And so the urgency of the moment is quite clear that we haven't done enough, that we haven't reached across our own silos enough and, and to essentially provide for a future that is sustainable for our own species, let alone all the other creatures on the earth upon which our health depends. I see several potential huge opportunities for the expertise uh, available in this group. The first is to better define the challenges we face. Uh, what defines a heat wave uh, is as diverse as the countries on the planet. We don't have a shared understanding of the threat we face. And uh, that's an issue that this group could really help with. And it is critical to better define that if we're really gonna take the measures that need to be done to protect not only ourselves, but again, the life upon which our health depends. The second opportunity is to get at the challenge of equity, which so many of, of, of those who've participated in this meeting have discussed. Uh, the pandemic that we're dealing with is really a consequence of inequity in our societies. And heat is yet another wedge. Uh, the exposure to heat is a wedge that drives inequity and that will compound all the other threats, climate change writ large, the emergence of infectious diseases, national security concerns. And so solving heat is really fundamental to addressing inequity, which is essentially kindling for all of the other crises that we can see unfold before us. The third major opportunity is the issue of financing for the interventions we need. As a pediatrician, as someone who spends half my time taking care of people and half my time trying to take care of the nature our lives depend on, I'm always struck at how wildly we undervalue the benefits to ourselves and to nature of the actions we take. And the kind of work that has been discussed here, the kind of work we need to do to address heat is a prime example. Whether, how we monetize our investments. When we look at carbon value, we often don't look at health value. When we look at health value, we tend to only look at a very narrow fraction of the health value. We tend to, uh, in those circumstances, not necessarily look at the ecological value that is obviously important for sustaining nature in ways we don't even understand how that value matters for itself. And in some ways we very clearly do when it comes to, for example, water provision. And so I think this group is uniquely well positioned to broaden the value proposition, to make the investments that are gonna save our lives and save our societies ever more attractive to the world around us. And so I'm really thrilled to be a part of this initiative and to hopefully drive forward solutions uh, that are really gonna make a difference to our children, to uh, those who are most concerned about the most vulnerable in our societies. And I wanna thank Kathy and the team at the center again for the opportunity to participate. Hello everybody, uh, greetings from uh, Ecuador. Uh, my name is Mauricio Rodas. I am the former mayor of Quito and I'm currently uh, a visiting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania uh, working on the city's climate resilient infrastructure financing initiative. Um, in order for cities to play their role in um, supporting countries to meet their NDCs and to achieve the Paris Agreement goals, uh, we need for them to improve their access to the international financial system. An international financial system that was not designed for cities, but for countries. So if we want cities also to address such an important issue like extreme heating, we need to improve their accessibility to these resources. And that's what we're trying to do through the initiative that I just mentioned, supporting, guiding city officials on how to access 
to international financing. Extreme heating uh, is uh, causing uh, currently nearly twice as many fatalities in the US, uh, much more than any other uh, weather hazard. Uh, this gives us an idea of how urgent is to address this issue in cities. And the only way we will be able to do so is by enhancing their, their opportunities to receive financing. Uh, and I am very honored uh, also to be a senior fellow at the Adrian Ars Rockefeller Foundation Center. And of course, delighted to be part of this alliance and very willing to contribute with experiences and ideas for its success. Thank you so much to Kathy, to the Atlantic Council, to the Resilience Center uh, for this great opportunity. Thank you very much everyone, to all the members, to Commissioner Lara, to the mayors, we are immensely grateful for your participation and your passion and your expertise, and we will get to work putting it um, into action. And that closes our session today. Um, I wanted to say an extra thanks to the CEO of the Atlantic Council, Fred Kemp, for hosting the Resilience Center and all of the support to uh, see this work flourish and for the partnership we have. And I also, again, want to say thank you to Adrian Arsht, for her support, her vision for resilience, and to the Rockefeller Foundation. And we will be following up on all of your questions that you have submitted. Um, given our time constraints, we are going to move um, right into our event. And let me turn it over to Rena Nainen. She is a, an anchor, a journalist, a foreign correspondent. And over to you, Rena. And thank you again to all of the ERA members. We look forward to next steps, and we're going to get started right away. Thank you. Kathy, thank you so much. And thank you to your incredible team for putting on this global event. It's pretty remarkable to see the impact that the center is making. And I want to tell everyone, wherever you are, uh, feel free to email resilience at atlanticcouncil.org so you can get a sense of some of the other programming and events. Uh, the center couldn't be more impactful at a moment of, of this pandemic. I want to move on and actually welcome back um, our, our panelists. We've got Kathy, Madeline, and Jeff. You know, this past summer, it was more than 100 degrees in the Arctic Circle and 125 degrees this weekend in Baghdad, Iraq. This, this panel couldn't come at a better time. And I want to start back and toss it right back to Kathy um, Bachman McLeod, of course, who's the director and senior vice president of the Adrian Arsht Rockefeller Foundation uh, Resilience Center, to get her opening thoughts. Kathy. Rina, thank you. Um, I, I feel like I have um, shared a good bit of our perspective, but I think the, the number one message that we want to convey today is the importance of communicating what this risk is, understanding that risk better, and getting to those solutions, um, some of those being uh, low cost and no cost easy pieces and some that you heard referenced in our first part of the panel today about uh, systemic financial risk um, solutions that are more macro in nature and we have to do them all. But the key thing is we can't solve a problem if it's silent. And so uh, I look forward to the conversation today and hearing from other panelists about all of the um, important underpinnings of this work will have some significant work in terms of science and technical capacities necessary to define some of those things that uh, Dr. Bernstein referenced in terms of definitions. And if you name and rank a hurricane, uh, what does the ranking mean in local places? And, and heat waves are different from hurricanes as we've explored. They are about human vulnerability and not about wind speed. And so there's a lot of work to be done regionally and to understand uh, the technical aspects. But I also wanna highlight that naming and ranking heat waves is the gateway to other and many tried and true and innovative solutions <laughs> for addressing extreme heat. And I look forward to the conversation and to the cartoons as we get into it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. And yes, we're going to have an incredible interactive uh, segment after this where we're going to have these remarkable cartoons that the New Yorker cartoonists have put together. And feel free, I want to let everyone know you can share your comments, your thoughts, and your reactions right there at the bottom of the Q&A button. So feel free to join in the conversation. Next, I want to welcome Madeline Thompson, who's the head of Our Planet, Our Health at Welcome Trust. Madeline. Well, good morning and good afternoon, uh, everybody from the UK. Thank you, uh, Kathy, for your leadership and the extraordinary community that you've convened here today. 
Um, as mentioned, I work at the Wellcome Trust, uh, which is a financially and politically independent foundation that exists to improve health. And as one of the world's largest charitable organizations, we are committed to taking on some of the biggest challenges facing the world today. With a central core in discovery science, the trust is moving towards a new strategy um, focused on three global challenges where research can inform policy and practice and save lives. And the three new challenge areas identified are infectious disease, obviously absolutely critically um, important today, mental health, uh, which is also another issue that is increasingly important, and climate change. I am absolutely thrilled to um, be joining this event today, um, focusing on protecting people from extreme heat, uh, which as we have heard so compellingly from so many speakers, is a major issue of our time and will only get worse if we do not do something about it. All right. Madeline, thank you. We look forward to having your thoughts as well with the cartoons. Uh, next, I want to bring in Jeff Goodell, who is a non-resident senior fellow at the Adrian Arsh Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center, of course, with the Atlantic Council. And Jeff's also working on a new book that I hope we can talk a little bit about later as well. Jeff. Thanks, Raina. Um, it's great to be here. It's great to hear all of your thoughts about this and to be uh, participating in this um, great initiative. You know, I. I guess I want to just start with just say a few things, big picture things uh, about what I've been learning as I've been working on this book for a year about um, extreme heat. You know, I wrote a book previously about um, sea level rise, and I'm struck by how different these issues are. We talk about climate change all the time, and um, and we kind of think of it all as one big um, kind of crisis, which of course it is. But you know, heat is so different than than the issue of sea level rise. Um, which is basically, you know, to be really kind of blunt, a kind of, you know, a, a real estate problem, whether it's real estate in Bangladesh or real estate in Miami Beach, it's about flooding of coastal regions and cities and people being displaced and all that goes along with that. But heat is really a, um, uh, uh, as Kathy has pointed out, a, a human killer. And it's really a, a, a human story in a way that other aspects of the climate crisis aren't. And I think that one of the, big things that I'm kind of grappling with in putting this book together is this notion that um, as extreme heat increases, we're moving outside of the human niche of where we have evolved for thousands of years. And I think it's easy to say that and it's, and you know, there have been studies recently talking and uh, Dr. Bernstein mentioned, you know, the displacement of, um, of people outside of this habitable zone um, and it's going to cause, um, obviously death and migration and, and all kinds of um, issues. But, but what's kind of struck me is uh, how little we understand this, you know, and how large the implications of this really are. We don't really understand the implications of heat on um, our psychological processes. There's a lot of interesting work on the connections with heat and uh, violence that we have not really understood, uh, economic productivity, and also something that is very timely right now, which is um, disease, and not just with COVID, but with um, changing disease vectors as cities warm up, places like uh, Mexico City uh, get warmer. They have been sort of too cold for many mosquitoes that carry diseases like dengue fever and Zika and things like that. And that is changing and that's going to have enormous human impacts. So, so those are sort of some of the big picture things that I've been thinking about. Jeff, thank you. And, and I hope we can get to talking a little bit about how COVID and diseases are also impacted by heat. It's something that I didn't realize until I spoke to you about this. Um, I'd love to open it up and to start with one of the first cartoons from one of the New Yorker cartoonists who put together. Uh, if we could start with that and get Kathy to comment sort of a little bit about how this really is a silent killer that many people don't know about. Kathy, this first cartoon, walk us through it. What do we see here? Well, I think the, that um, the artist, Mr. Cooper, has very well captured um, the threat. And we talk about the, the threat. She can't see the threat. The threat is a, a monster with teeth coming in the window. Um, she is um, struggling with the temperature, clearly. She has three fans going, and we assume she doesn't have air conditioning. Her window is open, and she's looking at the TV and she's looking at those temperatures 
she got a fan in her hand and she's sweating and she is looking at the weather and the weather tells us that heat wave Mitch is on the way. And I think it is a clear and well done depiction of this threat and how it lands um, in, in real life. And um, there are lots of things that you could imagine about her and about the life that she lives. Um, I love that she has her pearl earrings on, I think, or some <laughs> earrings. I think that detail is really lovely and her flowered uh, jacket. Um, and so let's see what some other folks think. But I think this one is a great depiction of our vision of communicating heat waves uh, to where it is a, a standard every day. This is what it would look like when you turned on the TV and you were checking the weather. You would read about or see, hear about heat wave Mitch. I love that. I love how you can see just like tracking a hurricane, how this whole new initiative of naming it and getting it out to the public so they they know that this is just as deadly and, and something you've got to pay attention to. I think it's so fabulous that you've launched that initiative. Jeff, I want to take your thoughts uh, on the next cartoon that you see right here. Um, what comes to mind when you see this? <laughs> well, uh, I think that this cartoon is sort of brilliant in its utter simplicity. I mean, you know, yeah. I mentioned, and we've all mentioned this notion of uh, killer heat and the the human uh, health risks from heat, and you know, this pretty pretty much captures it as as clearly as one can do. And um, I love its uh, you know utter simplicity and it's not nuanced. It's you know the knife hanging from the sun and the thread is is quickly you know melting and um, it, it kind of captures it all in in all the drama of this. And and it, the brilliant thing about it is that you know one of the hard things about about talking about extreme heat and especially as someone who works in the media, is, is that it's very hard to visually represent it in any way. I mean, you can have pictures of sweating people and things like that, but compared to, you know, floods or deforestation or many other impacts of climate change, heat is really, really hard to communicate visually. And, and I think that's a huge issue as we think about how to deal with this and educate people about this. And this cartoon just captures the complete essence of what we're talking about very clearly. It is so hard to convey just the damage and how deadly heat can be, but that large knife over hanging over the city is pretty powerful. Yeah, it's, re it's really great. And it's it's great that it's hanging over um, a city also um, yeah. and not just sort of over some sort of uh, random glow, you know, a globe or something more sort of generic. It's And it's it's obviously not hanging over uh, Midtown Manhattan, either. It's hanging yeah. over, um, you know, what is obviously a kind of lower income kind of mm -hmm. uh, uh, cityscape. It's a, a killer that affects all of us. I'd love to turn to the next cartoon. Madeline, I'd love to get your thoughts on what you see here. Interesting. You've got this guy with a uh, cigarette coming out of his mouth, pointing to the heat wave. And you see all the cars and it's almost like a highway mm -hmm. there. It's a really complicated image. And I must admit, I think the cartoons produced for this session are just absolutely fabulous. It hadn't occurred to me how much you can actually capture in a cartoon. And there are all the sort of more obvious things, the cars, the, the smoke from the factory coming out of his nose, um, the deforestation he's stamping on, the, the forests are on fire, um, the crushing impact of his body on nature generally. But I also thought one of the his posture um, just lying there on the ground. And it struck me as a just a laziness, an inaction, an inability to actually to see the problem and just not do anything about it. And I think that is one of the biggest challenges that we face today. And it's beautifully captured in this cartoon, just an uh, inability to get up and do something. Mm. You know, Madeline, you've done so much work researching the impacts of heat and health as well, particularly with infants and children. There's one question um, coming up here from one of our participants here um, who's viewing saying, how close are we to having heat insurance? What would it look like? Who would buy it? Is that something that could protect people, particularly the most vulnerable of our population, children and young families? Well, I think that is a big challenge because I don't I honestly don't know anything particularly about heat insurance, but insurers like to insure things that don't happen very often. Mm 
Mm. So uh, flood risk insurance, we've seen how it's become increasingly difficult for people to get flood risk insurance because of the increased amount of flooding in certain areas. And as heat waves increase, um, I would say even if heat wave insurance is initiated, it will become increasingly difficult uh, to maintain. So, yes, insurance does provide some solutions, but um, uh, when heat is on a trend to be a continuously warmer climate with spikes in the climate created by short term variability, um, then it might be tough to actually get the insurance companies to buy in. So I'd be very interested to hear from them. Yeah, Kathy, I'd love to get you to weigh in. You know, hurricane insurance down in South Florida, where I'm from, very difficult rates through the roof. What do you think about this prospect of, of some sort of a heat insurance? I think that there's a, um, a role for parametric insurance policies um, and the higher end of those heat events. And so um, just as Madeline said, there's a uh, a, a range of things that happen frequently and increasingly frequently, but there are also going to be some events that are truly devastating. And a lot of insurance then is about finding that place. What is it that the community or the economy or the or the human beings can't take? And understanding the risks and um, thinking about those products, not necessarily or only as market products, but as an approach that is a combined with um, mm -hmm access to investment capital for long-term heat reducing um, interventions like the urban forests and um, cooler surfaces. There's a, there's a complement, a holistic approach that can involve insurance for those higher end, more extreme um, events. And I think we'll explore that to, to find the best role. Um, and there's lots of work ahead. Mm. I'd love to turn to the next cartoon, if we could get that up. A devil there, look at that. I don't know, the, the caption below, I, I don't know if everyone can see it. It says, I don't know how you stand it up here nowadays. Um, this is by Emily Flake. Kathy, I'd love to get you to weigh in. I think this one is, um, what's most obvious about this one is what you don't see. And I think when we heard from Jad Daly from American Forests about tree equity, I think this is coming uh, into clear focus with this cartoon. There is not one speck of vegetation in sight and it's all impervious surface, all asphalt. And so um, I read it to say he's arrived up from, um, from hell and <laughs> saying, it's so hot. I, you know, I, I, I come up here often and now when I come, it's so hot, how do you stand it? Mm -hmm. And that's hilarious on one level. And then the other is uh, this person is um, of color, this is a place with no trees, and this is um, the quintessential image of the lack of tree equity, uh, just as Jad was saying, and many other speakers today. Yeah, the devil coming down saying it's hotter here than it is in hell. Pretty funny, <laughs> pretty funny. Uh, Kathy, I'd love to turn to the next one and get you to weigh in as well, if you don't mind. And the caption below says, we'll be naming the next heat wave Derek after my most difficult to manage child. <laughs> I, I like this one just, and it is, um, it's simple. It is, um, it's a global agency of some kind, you know, you, you could take it to be the World Meteorological Organization, but you have this crest that says it's maybe the UN, you don't know, and these three officials, um, they could be testifying and they're talking about what, um, talking about naming the next storm or the next heat wave. And I think um, it gives you an image of how does it get done? Who does it? What are the, um, you know, what are the settings where this kind of work would be done to name heat waves? And the, of course, the humor, you know, a heat wave is very difficult to manage. And so um, difficult to manage child seems just right. Just right. Derek is that's kind of funny too. I don't know why. But. That is pretty funny. You know, we've got one more cartoon I'd love to go through. Jeff, I'd love to get you to comment on it. It says, it's absurd to think that it won't get warm enough to colonize. That would require them to work together. These aliens in a spaceship looking down and commenting on Earth. Yeah, I had to read this a couple of times to quite, uh, it's, not, it's not as bluntly simple as the, uh, the knife hanging over the city that we saw before, <laughs> but I think it's, it's great because it, um, it gets to an issue that we don't, haven't talked a lot about here, uh, but which is really important in the sort of larger thinking about this, which is 
you know, the reason we're talking about extreme heat and the reason that we're all here concerned about this and we're thinking about various kinds of adaptations and things is because we are putting too much CO2 into the atmosphere and we're continuing to burn fossil fuels and we're continuing to, to raise the risks of, of extreme heat and, and all the things that go along with burning fossil fuels. And this really captures that, right? The, the idea of, you know, ultimately the way to deal with extreme heat is by stopping the burning of fossil fuels and not just in the United States, but collectively. And from the beginning of the whole climate crisis, you know, since James Hansen's first testimony back in the 80s, the question has been, how do we as a planet come together to deal with this problem? How do we humans come together to, you know, to acknowledge this problem, deal with it, and do something about it. And, you know, the news is after 40 years, we haven't done much. And so here we are. And so these aliens were kind of right. And they have their own kind of alien intelligence here, which I think is kind of brilliant. I love that alien intelligence. That's so great. And especially looking down on Earth there. Um, I'd love to open it up to some questions. Um, you know, Madeline, I know that you wrote a book on climate data and sort of, you know, incorporating health decisions with that data points that you have. Yeah. Where do you see us headed right now? And what do you believe is really a, a critical phase to look at when you incorporate the data that you're seeing? Well, first of all, I think you have to understand, just like with COVID-19, we've been successful to the extent that we have in controlling the disease because there's been a scientific approach in not everywhere as effectively, but also a data-driven approach. So understanding that data uh, and science are essential, but not sufficient to solving these problems, I think is, is really critical. And then also to realize that um, in uh, some parts of the world, yes, we have great data infrastructure. We have great capacity to transform that data into information, to build forecasts out of it, to incorporate those forecasts in decision-making tools. But many parts of the world which are also affected by heat um, don't have that capacity. Mm -hmm. And I think that we really need to think, how do we support partners around the world to make sure that they have the underlying surveillance uh, capability, the underlying forecasting capability to be able to see what is going on in their own communities and prepare and respond effectively to that. So I do think we have a global challenge on the data side, and I think making data understood as a really important and relevant part of the solution. Speaking of data, Jeff, I mean, you're writing a book that's looking at sort of the, this confluence of heat, COVID, the changing patterns really, um, that of d the changing disease patterns. How, what are you seeing in, in that, especially as we're in the midst of this COVID pandemic? Well, I mean, it's really interesting because um, first of all, I had not really been thinking a, a lot about this uh, when I started the book. And then, of course, COVID came along and that uh, changed everything. Um, and so I've been thinking about it through the lens of, you know, the sort of compounding crisis that we've talked about here that, you know, um, that extreme heat is hitting and, um, and impacting largely the same kind of uh, population that, that COVID is hitting and that people who are least um, able to cope with and most exposed to, cope to, to COVID are the same who are most exposed to extreme heat. I've been spending a lot of time in Texas and in Houston and looking at, at that. But, you know, the other thing that's really emerged out of this is how uh, and is very important for cities and thinking about dealing with heat is, is these changing disease vectors and that how uh, you have, um, you know, especially mosquitoes and ticks, but as mosquitoes especially are, you know, exquisitely designed temperature organisms. They're exquisitely sensitive to temperature and, and even a movement of a few degrees uh, can have huge implications uh, for where these mosquitoes go, carrying all the um, parasites and viruses and bacteria that, um, that they do that cause things like Zika and Dengue and West Nile virus. Uh, what the best example of this and the implications of this that I've seen is in West Africa, where we know, obviously, everyone knows there's a, a large malaria, a big malaria problem there. Hundreds of thousands of people um, uh, die from malaria still in, in West Africa. There's been an enormous effort to stop that and to uh, remedy that. 
And one of the things that's that's coming clear is that it's going to get too hot in West Africa for malaria soon. And what, malaria is going to move east in Africa to, uh, to the eastern part of the continent. And in one level, that's sort of good news for West Africa. But the thing is, is that the mosquitoes that carry uh, malaria may not sort of be able to adapt to the high heat in West Africa, but the mosquitoes that carry dengue uh, will. And so you're going to basically uh, replace malaria with dengue uh, in West Africa. And the implications of that are huge because um, these mosquitoes bite in a different kind of way. The mosquito nets and uh, much of the adaptations we have for the mosquitoes that cause malaria will not work for dengue. So the, the human health implications of a changing of a degree or two of temperature in West Africa because of these disease vectors is really enormous. Mm. I was thinking of you, Jeff, I, I take walks every day and it doesn't matter what time of day, I feel like I'm suddenly being bitten alive by far more mosquitoes uh, this summer and the impact of, of what that's had, you know, especially in this month of August where it's been raging heat around here. Um, Kathy, I'd love to turn to you. You know, it's remarkable that the Resilience Center has chosen of all the climate change issues, there's a lot of them that you guys focus on, but to zero in on the importance of looking at heat and educating the public. What do you feel, Kathy, how do you build an international community to try and combat and make the public aware so perhaps people can move to action on this issue? Thank you, Rena. Uh, the, the first stop for us is to find existing frameworks and platforms and fora that offer the um, ability to do that with examples that have uh, shown um, to have worked in the past. So we don't want to create anything new. And there are uh, several and wildly successful um, efforts around heat in terms of the, the scientific community and networks of um, scientists and policy practitioners, such as the um, National Integrated Heat Health Information System, which is a, a US national um, collaboration. And then there is a, a global organization called GIN, which is the Global Heat Health Information Network. And so we will uh, use the existing networks and partners to uh, as quickly as possible, build that framework. And we have a, a notion now uh, that looks at looking at California, the way that Cal that uh, the commissioner of insurance today, Ricardo Laura said, I'm going to work with my colleagues in California, but we'll, we'll coordinate with NOAA and the National Weather Service. And so we'll plot a path forward that is a parallel track for California, uh, for tracks for the, for the nation, and then also for the global um, arrangement that we need that is the a light enough framework that lets us get to naming storms that's robust enough in terms of the science and the and the technical questions of which there are many to be explored and so we'll be thinking about um, the UNFCCC and the, the the UN climate change convention and the Glasgow uh, conference of the parties meeting as a place to attract countries and regions uh, to this issue and to this particular policy intervention and so we'll start with what's worked and we'll build um, a framework that fits nicely on top and bring in all the experts and just hustle because this is urgent. Yeah, it certainly is urgent. And I think it's absolutely remarkable, Kathy, how you've been able to get um, leaders from Chennai all the way to Miami to be involved, which, which says a lot about how serious the center is on this issue. Um, I want to turn it one more question. Um, Madeline, I want to ask you, what's the future? going forward. You focus on this issue a great deal. Where do you see us headed? Well, I think going back to that last cartoon with the aliens uh, looking down on planet Earth, the future can only be global cooperation in this space. We absolutely have to get our act together and deal with the climate crisis. And we will see, and I think learn very painfully from COVID-19, that we are only able to uh, deal with COVID if we work together internationally, if we bring the science in, et cetera. And that learning, we have to bring it now immediately into the activities like this one. So I think absolutely we have a pathway forward. We can do this. We just have to actually act. I'd love to now get um, just some sort of closing thoughts from each of you. Jeff, I'd love to start with you about your sense. 
Well, I mean, I certainly echo what Madeline just said. Uh, you know, I, I think that for me, um, I think it's important to, to grasp that we are not going to sort of fix uh, climate change. We're not going to fix uh, extreme heat in, the, in a simple way. We're not going to make it go away. You know, even if we get our act together and re reduce emissions to zero by 2050, which is what the you know scientists are telling us we need to do to, to have a chance at staying below two C of warming, the warming that we have in the type in the pipeline now and that we are experiencing now will continue. It's not like when we stop emitting CO2, it's going to suddenly cool off because the CO2 stays in the atmosphere for centuries, and so we're going to be dealing with this and more for a very long time. So that's why I think that with all it's you know cutting emissions and 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 getting our act together the way that uh, Madeline suggested is hugely important. But so is the stuff that we're doing here, which is you know thinking about how to adapt. We have to reimagine our physical world for the climate crisis. It's not just about recycling plastic bags and driving electric cars. It's about reimagining the world that we live in in a very mm -hmm. profound way. Reimagining the world. I love that. Uh, Kathy, I'd love to get you to weigh in. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks to the speakers and to you, Rena, for um, this conversation today. Uh, I want to be sure uh, to point out um, that Adrian Arsh pointed out that the knife hanging over the city um, looks very much like the sword of Damocles. And <laughs> Um, if you all know the story of Damocles, I think that is, um, I didn't make the connection and I just wanted to share with everybody. I think it's so right on. That's what that, that thin thread, the knife over and the story of, of um, Damocles is that power comes with responsibility and with danger. And I think um, I missed that and I'm appreciative of the observation. So I wanted to share that with everybody. Um, I also want to say a deep and sincere thanks to our uh, senior fellow Pablo Suarez, who inspired us with the idea of the cartoons, and um, he he works with the Climate Center of the Red Cross, Red Crescent, and many other um, amazing talents, a Renaissance man, an artist, a, a physicist, and um, a friend. And so, Pablo, it's been um, a remarkable and really uh, inspiring experience to explore this issue through these images and thank you to the New Yorker cartoonist who uh, participated with us and we look forward to using them um, to support my last point which is awareness education awareness education will focus on that first as I said the alliance will do four things educate advance policy create new risk and finance tools and approaches and do work on the ground in communities uh, who are on the, the front lines in those cities. So thank you very much, Rena. Thank you. And I want to let everyone know that you can continue the conversation here. We've got so many great questions uh, and folks weighing in. Uh, I just want to remind you, you can continue on Twitter and, and social media by sharing the hashtag EHRA and hashtag name the wave at Arst Rock as well. And also check out One Billion Resilient. Dot org. You can revisit the ca cartoons and repost them to continue the conversation. It'll be open for about 24 hours for the event, and um, you can post on social media until August 6. Kathy, I want to thank you and the center for being so forward in highlighting why this is such an important issue, especially in the midst of a pandemic. And I'd love to turn it back over to you, Kathy, to wrap it up. Thank you. And again, thank you to everyone for your contributions today and for those who uh, stayed on for what may feel like a marathon Zoom. Um, we uh, are here at the right time and these actions and these partners uh, to come together is um, inspiring, but also now it's time to get to work. And we will be meeting um, in September and setting targets and uh, measurable, tangible uh, metrics for ourselves and will be engaging within and beyond the Alliance. But the important thing is that we share what this issue um, is doing and um, have the, the, the passion, the motivation and the urgency. People are suffering and economies are being set back and with COVID and with storms and with all of the other um, economic uh, threats that we see and experience, food and water insecurity, this issue is, um, one of the best things that we can be working on together and we look forward to delivering real results. Uh, and thank you again for joining us and thank you to Adrian Arsht and to the Rockefeller Foundation for making it possible.